think that's enough from me. I think everybody's got the, the idea of what we're here to talk about. So um, we'll get started. Welcome everyone to this UPU webinar, Sustainable Means Equal, Women in Postal Leadership. I'm your host, Ian Kerr. Some of you would know me as the host of the UPU Voice Mail podcast and various other things that I do around the traps in the postal and delivery sector. We have four fantastic guests today bringing, as I said, very, well, not just expertise, but different perspectives, different perspectives geographically, uh, professionally um, on this topic that we're going to explore today. So uh, just to give you a quick idea, we've got uh, Susan Alexander joining us from the UPU. We've got Christine Bergum from Poston Norge. I think I've pronounced that just about right. I'm getting a nod. There you go. Um, Jennifer Beiro Reveille from the US Postal Service and Pierangela Sierra, who is the co-founder and CEO of Tipti. Now, as I said, four very different voices talking about this uh, this interesting topic that we've got today. So I might just allow them to introduce themselves rather than me reading through their biographies. Um, Susan, we might begin with you. Uh, just please give us a bit of information about the role that you're doing now and a bit about how you got there and uh, sort of your observations on uh, twin topics today. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Ian. It's good to uh, be here and to see so many people from all over the world. I am Susan Alexander, and I am the Sustainable Development Program Manager at the UPU. I've been doing this for the past four years. And before that, most of the time of most of the 25 years that I've been at the UPU has been in regulatory affairs um, and also with assisting the secretariat for the Congresses and for the Council of Administration. Before that, for a very few years, I was an attorney in the United States. I'm obviously you can tell from my accent, I'm an American. But as I say, I've lived here in Switzerland for 25 years and I call Bern home. And Susan, just a quick comment then from you about uh, why gender equality is important in this idea of sustainable development. Well, sustainable development is a cross-cutting issue. It's got its own UN sustainable development goal, but it cuts across all of the other issues. On average, women are more likely to be excluded from access to decent work, education, health services, they are overrepresented in the global poor and older people. So women are potentially more vulnerable to shocks such as pandemics and environmental disasters. The United Nations Development Goals and the UPU Sustainable Development Program is aimed at all of these issues and more, education, um, clean environments, all of these things. And because there are groups like women and other vulnerable people who are not usually the decision makers during a sustainable development project discussion, they're, they need to be they need to be brought to the table. They need to be represented so that these sustainable development projects will work. From your perspective at the UPU and having, uh, as you said, 25 years experience at the UPU, what do you have any observations you can share on trends in things like invo women's involvement in the postal sector? Um, you may just mention the importance of it. So what, what have you seen in terms of the actual representation of women in the postal sector? Well, we don't have specific statistics. This is something that we want to take care of. Um, I just, I'd like to briefly mention that in our Congress in 2021, the uh, all 192 member countries unanimously approved a resolution for us to develop a gender sustainability policy. So we will be rolling that out starting this year, which is why we plan to take as the first step a survey to find out where the post sits in terms of women's representation. We do know that um, the, in general, the logistics area is, is very male dominated. And so the post is also, and particularly at the, um, at the management level. With this research that you'll be doing, is that the kind of thing that hosts will be able to benchmark themselves against to be able to measure their progress? Absolutely. We'll be doing a full study. We often uh, take an issue and we'll look at it geographically in terms of regions. We'll look at it in terms of level of development and there will be benchmarking um, factors so that so that members will be able to have a look and, and see where they stand. And we'll be doing a lot more um, in terms of raising awareness and assisting our members to reach to, to support the goal of, of gender equality. And just one quick 
final comment before we go to our next speaker. Uh, so you've mentioned about the, the research and the measurement and the benchmarking. Is there anything outside of that that comes to mind that, that the postal sector could do to try and foster greater involvement of women, of women at every level of the organisation? Absolutely. Uh, in terms of what the post can do for, uh, for in general, to, to, to help with the sustainable development goals, governments, international agencies, civil society and businesses should be able to realize that the global postal network can help them by many projects that they're already undertaking, such as promoting the education of women and girls, ensuring participation of women in democratic processes, delivering information campaigns to end discrimination, exploitation and violence, and using the universal postal service to ensure all women have access to social welfare and reproductive health resources. The post has a very wide network, has a large number of employees, and we can reach a lot of people through the postal network. Things are already being done by individual posts, and I have some examples that I'd, I'd like to give later when we when we come back to other questions. Um, but the, the post is already very active in providing services in terms of assistance to women. And another topic we might come to later is how the UPU itself can interface with other UN organisations, which uh, there's so much we can talk about. I, I should quickly mention those of you who are French speakers, you can access a French feed of this by clicking on the globe icon down the bottom and you'll be able to click on the French option. Though, Susan, I'm sure you probably speak. Well, French is our, our uh, official language and English is a working language. So yes, after 25 years, I've learned some. <laughs> I officially don't speak French. Uh, next. <laughs> Next panelist, we want to. I'd like to introduce is Christine Baragum uh, from Boston, Norway. Um, Christine, welcome. Um, I, I understand you've got a, a quick slide. Do you want to start off with the, the quick slide that you wanted to share with us, just to give a snapshot of where Boston is with its uh, in, engagement with uh, with well inclusive. What's it called? You call it an inclusivity. Or, and underrepresented groups. Is that how it's termed in, in Boston? Yes, yes, inclusion. So it's broader than gender. It's uh, it's part of our inclusion work. Uh, yes, I, I did have a slide, but should I start introducing myself a little bit? Oh yeah, well, please, sorry. <laughs> Where are my manners? Would you like to start like introducing the, your current role, what you do at Poston, and a bit about uh, what Poston's doing, please? Yes, I'm happy to. So I am Christine Bergum from Posten Norge. I will say Norway Post, that's easier in English. Uh, I'm in charge of international and regulatory affairs at Posten. I've been that for many years. So the international is both the, the business commercial responsibility and the regulatory responsibility for all the international mail um, uh, segment. And regulatory is both domestic and international regulation. You've you've been with uh, Norway Post for a few years now. Is it, have you always been involved in uh, in the international mail, international regulation, regulatory sector? Yes, I've always been involved in re regulation actually, and and mainly pushed a lot for for major domestic changes in regulation. But uh, for the last uh, six years or so, I have also been in charge of the commercial aspects of the international uh, mail well, segment. Yes. If I can put to you the same question I put to Susan before, why is gender equality important to achieve sustainable development in your opinion? Because sustainable development or the, I mean, the, the green issues, the emission cutting and so forth is, uh, is a matter of existence for us. So we need to work with that uh, extremely proactively. And, and, and I mean, we really do Need, we need to be excellent in that field and in order to work that well we need to recruit the best talents and and that's why we need to recruit um, from 100 percent of the talent base we can't just afford to recruit from from 50 percent of it so we need to recruit the most talented men and women to work in that field and we need to have an attractive working environment uh, so that people want to work with us so it is in a kind in a way a circle we need to attract the best people to achieve the best results and and we need to achieve very good results in in the environmental uh, aspect in in emission reductions and so forth in order to attract the best people so it's it's really fundamental and it's an integrated part of our business 
and at Boston, what sort of uh, what sort of trends are you observing when it comes to inclusivity? Where are you coming from? Where are you trying to get to? Yes, so we are um, there. You actually, if somebody could show the slide, it it, it would be helpful actually, uh, because we we are trying to achieve achieve a good mix of men and women on all levels. Uh, that is extremely important to us. So we have a lot of targets on that. So if you look at the right side of this slide first, where we have females in management, for instance, we have actually achieved a, a kind of the goal uh, as far as the top executive or the top levels are concerned. So on our top board and in the top positions, uh, the, the top executive positions, we are within the targeted 40 to 60 percent range of each gender. That is where we need to be. And we have a woman CEO, for instance, like most other Nordic posts for the time being, actually. Uh, and, and on the top executives, there are we are around the 50 50 targets. We need to be within the 40 60 percent range. That is where we are. But when it comes to all leaders, we are only around 30%. And there too, we need to go above 40% women leaders all, or all over the business. That is our target. And we are all followed up on that and working actively to have uh, at least 40% women leaders. Of course, you, there is some kind of excuse that we are a transport and logistics business, which is traditionally a more male kind of, of business uh, and it is sometimes harder to recruit women in, um, in closer to the operations, closer to the transport, that kind of uh, leader positions, uh, but we, we need to get there. So, uh, so we are going to get there, but it does take some time still. Uh, and it is vital uh, to, to kind of create a, an attractive working place, a place where people, where the talented people want to come and they want to stay and they want to contribute. We need to, we need to achieve these kind of good mixes between different groups of, uh, of people, including uh, women and men. Uh, and then I wanted to present, because I think always when we talk, it's, I mean, at least for myself, speaking for myself, I always like to have some facts. <laughs> I, I like figures and, and um, I want to have some facts before, before discussing more generally. And that's why I wanted to present this extremely unfancy <laughs> slide with only some figures and facts on it and no nice uh, drawings or anything. But um, as far as the um, CO2 emission reductions, we have worked um, systematically on, on that since 2010. Uh, we started, of course, earlier, but we, we were able to have a system, a very systematic uh, system for measuring and reporting and so forth in place uh, from then. So we have measured this systematically from 2012 and we have cut the absolute um, uh, CO2 uh, emissions with 45 percent uh, between 2012 and 2020. And that is quite a lot, actually. Relat relatively speaking, it's more than 45 percent since our business has grown and absolute emissions have been cut 45 percent. So we are working extremely actively on that. And, and in the current um, uh, current period from 2020 to towards uh, 2030, we need to cut another 42% of the absolute uh, emissions from our own transports, which actually means another 77% re relative to our current business. And that is extremely ambitious. Uh, we will only have emissions from bigger trucks after 2030 if we reach that goal. So it is very ambitious. Uh, now, working with subcontractors is more complicated in many ways. There are a lot of aspects uh, connected with that. So there we have a kind of more relative target, but whatever we buy should have 32% less uh, carbon emissions than they have today. And this is extremely difficult to achieve. This is very ambitious. Uh, but for us, it is a kind of a matter of survival. It's uh, it's a kind of license to, to operate, as we call it, because uh, we, we start to see that our customers will not buy uh, delivery with emissions anymore. The customers do not want to work with you if you are not ambitious on this. And, and employees will not want to work with, the, with you if you do not reach these kind of very ambitious targets in, in our country, in our culture. It's, uh, so it is a kind of license to operate and that's why we are so ambitious on these targets. 
One quick question before we move on was how you've talked about how you're, oh, we, we might go into the, the detail of how Poston is achieving some of these environmental goals as well, because you mentioned their subcontractors and line hall and things like that. But with regards to advancing women's leadership, you've identified this as something that Poston wants to do better. Can you share with us any quick comments on how Poston is trying to do that, um, it, it, trying to meet a, a, that, those goals? Yes, yes, it's it's worked systematically on that as well. It is, for instance, whenever you are announcing that you are, are recruiting some, uh, some, you want to recruit uh, somebody that there is a vacant position, uh, the text needs to be neutral so that it is equally attractive for, for women as for men, for instance. If it is a leadership position, you should always have at least one person of each gender in the kind of last round where you choose. Uh, there are a lot of these things and you, you need to work around these kind of more uh, um, these kind of gender norms and patterns that you, that could be uh, intrinsically exclusive of either men or women. So you need to be very conscious on these uh, on these things and, and, and sometimes actively encouraging women because apparently women sometimes need more active encouragement than men do in order to do, take on at least the higher positions. So, so that is, uh, it, it's part of our recruitment uh, system to actively try and uh, encourage women to also to go for all sorts of positions, also more technical and more manual kind of positions, which are traditionally more men, in order to get this, this mixture. So we work on that, yes. Thank you very much for that, Christine. I'm sure that's stimulated lots of ideas in people's own minds and I will see more questions coming through. If you want to ask questions, just pop it in the Q&A section. It's down the bottom of your screen on Zoom. If you click on Q&A, you can tap your question in there and I'll be able to see it and put it to the panel as we go along. Our next speaker is from the US Postal Service, Jennifer Bayro Revae. And Jennifer is Senior Director, Environmental Affairs and Corporate Sustainability. Jennifer, welcome. Would you like to just share with the audience a little bit about what you do at the US Postal Service and indeed just some comments about why gender, um, gender equality is important when it comes to achieving sustainability goals? Certainly, thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. And thank you for joining this very important conversation. I, um, I am an architect by training and uh, after I've currently been with the Postal Service for over 25 years prior to that, I was in the private sector. And my primary role for the Postal Service as Chief Sustainability Officer and another role of Chief Environmental Officer is to ensure that we are continuing in our environmental leadership and stewardship you cannot have a geographic footprint like the United States Postal Service and not be a good steward of the environment. So with that, I think I would like to share a screen, if I may. Are you seeing this? Yes, thank you. All right, so uh, obviously this slide has a lot of words on it, but um, I want to speak to the depth of the Postal Service and and that means the depth of our challenges with our universal service obligation which is to ensure that we deliver to all addresses we have quite a bit of challenges and um i i think after the many decades albeit centuries of doing this we've done a good job of uh, being the best steward of the environment while ensuring equality within um, our ranks and diversity and inclusion being a priority as you can see in the center of this screen, 49% of our senior management, so almost half are minorities. And again, of that senior management, 46% are women. And we are very proud of our continuing efforts and, and progress in diversity and inclusion and equity within a very diverse uh, population. Our focus is to ensure that we represent the communities that we serve. Otherwise, we don't become relevant. I think Susan and Christine did an excellent job of uh, speaking to the importance of diversity and inclusion and gender equality. And Christine said it very eloquently that this is not just important for the environment, but it's important 
so that we attract the proper uh, employee base. And we are that organization that people want to work for and that these different populations look to becoming a part of it. I think it's also more than just attracting them. These days, as a good thing, it's all about being relevant. As was mentioned earlier, this is an expectation of our customers. Uh, we cannot continue to think that we can uh, continue with um, the burning of fossil fuels and other challenges. And, and that's why this discussion today is so relevant. As mentioned earlier, I think that Susan, you know, these discussions are so important because we need to work together towards general equal solutions that mean that women have equal access to these key resources, whether those resources are, are clean water or financial sustenance because the negative outcomes of climate change, they typically do percolate more with and have a negative impact on women. And that includes older women as, as, as much as the very young. So these discussions, international discussions are critically important. Thanks, Ian. Sorry, I'd muted myself there. Um, the uh, you've 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 actually already answered, I think, <laughs> my next question, um, but which was about um, the trends when it comes to women's involvement in in the post, and we, I think we can see there from the, the the overall trends or the current statistics regarding involvement of minorities and women and even even veterans. Um, what let's return to this this idea also about women's leadership. What have you observed, or what do you think can be done to advance women's leadership in the postal sector? I, I think we have um, a very successful history in that and in that from the area levels very much so um, and we went through a restructure so I shouldn't say area but what I mean to say is that um, we have a large population of women that start as as letter carriers women and and other um, you know, relevant groups of yeah. the conversations exactly uh, of the population and they start with as letter carriers they work um to get the required training we have very aggressive training programs we have executive leadership programs and even management leadership programs that work to propel that talent into those positions of leadership we have a wonderful group here separate from my group which is um diversity equity and inclusion and their focus is just that uh, to and and separate from that group is a very large leadership organization that is focused on ensuring that we do ensure that our management is representative of the communities that we serve so as you can see from the numbers here, uh, we're doing a pretty good job of that, Ian. And I love this idea of reflecting the communities that you serve. And I, I think it's baked into law in some countries. Maybe people can chop, pop in the comments where it's re required by law in your country to say, have the relevant local languages represented in the postal sector, in your post office or in your postal delivery people. Um, please do get involved in the comments there. Now I'll introduce our fourth panelist. Um, Pierre Angela Sierra. She's the co-founder and CEO of Tipti. And oh, Pierre Angela, I'm going to please ask you to explain a little bit about what what Tipti is and your involvement with. And I never know if this is <coughs> excuse me an acronym you pronounce or what. The UNCTAD. So you please just share a bit with us about some uh, Tipti and your involvement there, please. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. I don't know. We have a lot of people around the world here. My name is Pierangela Sierra. I am. I came from the corporate world. I have been working 24 years for Colgate and Coca-Cola Company. And then three years ago, I decided to begin my startup with my husband. Uh, I am the CEO of Tipti. Tipti is the fastest growing e-groceries in Latin America. And we have a huge team right now, 500 people 
who is all the days buying the shopping the, the the groceries for our consumers and then they um go to the supermarket buy the shopping and then go to the houses maybe in your countries they're similar service uh, right now uh, after the pandemic they are very very uh, popular uh, and i am the advocate you, have, you asked me about the antad right i am the the e-trade for women advocate for the antad so our mission is to to drive a community a woman community for for all of the e-commerce digital for latin america and all other countries and all other continents and I, I represent latin america in the caribbean and we are working very hard to try to to drive more women in the esteem uh, area because we are so so few well that leads into again the first question which is why is gender equality important and you just mentioned the underrepresentation of women in STEM. So, what, why is why is um, gender equality important to achieve this goal of sustainable development? Well, I think equality is not a gender issue; it's a business one. Uh, gender equality in Latin America and in other in other parts of the world uh, seems far behind of what we really need in our in our business. And these matters. This matters uh, because gender equality increases economic growth, enhances fairness, strengthens peace and security, reduces corruption, and raises social and environmental sustainability. I want to share three benefits of gender equality in the workplace. First of all, better economy. We have a lot of um, surveys, statistics, but according to McKenzie, if more women be able to fully participate in paid work and earn equal pay, that could add. 28 trillion to global gross domestic product it's huge amount of money and that will be a 26 percent increase by 2025. the second one improved productivity um, and according to the university of Greenwich, one of the major benefits of improved gender e equality in the workplace is more cohesive productive workforce innovation uh, and uh, inclusiveness it has a lot of benefits in terms of emotional, physical, professional, and personal for all the workforce. And third, and third, the increase of growth and innovation and empowering bias-free and supportive gender equal workplace leads to an innovation, creativity, productivity mindset. And according to Accenture, it has a potential to add eight trillion dollars if we really incorporate in our in our in our. Uh, companies in our business, a lot of different um, gender equality. Summarizing as my own experience with Tipti, which is the fastest growing online delivery platform in Latin America, when when I gave women the access to opportunities for career growth, they make huge impact on the company. Also, the functional areas that are led by women has the highest pro uh, productivity with the lowest turn off rates. So it's very important for me to have a lot of women in the company. But most important, while some new works happen in a public in a public policy level, we in the in the private um, section we could take specific actions to make real change in our company, in our system, and being a real agent of change to to, to have much more women in our in our uh, ecosystem in our workplace. You've been talking about the business and the or strategic importance of, of inclusivity. Is this uh, almost a, a development of what Jennifer was saying about making sure that your own workforce represents the people that you, or well, Jennifer thinks said the communities that you serve, or is in this case your customer base? Is that a similar sort of concept to play here? Yeah. Yeah, because if we if we can drive a community, a women community that could help each other, we are going to serve and, and have a more cast, uh, we, we could we could uh, have a uh, build a, more, a, a better customer experience. So we we could have a, a, a better ecosystem, a better business. Uh, we could we could serve better to our consumers. And since we're also talking about sustainability, I might throw in a quick question that I didn't ask you to be prepared for, <laughs> but the we, we we talk so much in the delivery sector and the postal world about reducing emissions. Mm -hmm. Has this been part of the conversation in the e-commerce world about reducing emissions? And does that somehow intersect with the discussion about inclusivity within your own business? 
Well, I think I think that um, as we are doing shopping for other people, we are in fact reducing emission right now because there's a lot of people that are in the houses or in the office and they are not driving to the supermarket. So in fact, we are now reducing. However, uh, we need to work uh, in, including another uh, innovations like uh, electric cars so far for, for, for Latin America, but maybe it will happen in any time. And for sure that will help us to drive much more uh, uh, women's involvement uh, um, because uh, the young people is very interested in drive sustainability in, in a highway. Now that we've all heard from each of our speakers, please do continue to pop your questions in the Q&A section uh, on Zoom. Um, Kate Muth from IMAG has made a quick comment here about, she said that the statistics in leadership for US Postal Service and POSTM are, are impressive and something to be proud of. Uh, but the representation of women on the governing body of the Postal Services in the US Postal Service is the Board of Governors isn't quite at that same level. Uh, she, she says the only one woman in the nine presidentially appointed governors, well, I've got that around the wrong way, There's, oh, there is only one woman in the nine presidentially appointed governors. And that's the first female governor since 2006. Now, don't worry, I'm not gonna put anybody in the spot here, um, but perhaps in the comments section, if people from other posts would like to comment on how many, or the, the makeup of, the, um, of their governing board, male versus female, what it's like, please do jump in the comments and share with us there if you've got um, any um, any insights that you can share about the involvement of women at that, what would you call it, the board level or the board of governors level for your post. Um, the So thanks, Kate, for that question. And please, everybody, do keep popping your questions in the Q&A section. We'll try to get through them as we go along. Um, Christine, we might just come back to you because you mentioned sort of a couple of things in passing there, which would be great to get in a bit more detail. Um, just m m focusing on the sustainability element for a moment. You are talking about how uh, Poston has been seeking to meet its or reduce its emissions and it sets specific goals. Can you share a few examples of how Poston is doing that? I can. Um, uh, we are working, of course, um, very much on the vehicles. Um, the first thing that was possible to attack, because I mean, this is uh, dependent on the techno technological development. I mean, we, you need to have vehicles available, uh, was um, on the smaller vehicles to deliver mail, for instance. Um, and uh, we were uh, we, we were buying electric vehicles, uh, a lot of them, but we didn't find them satisfactory for all purposes. So we actually developed uh, together with a car manufacturer. We do not have car manufacturing in Norway. So this is now the, the one and only car manufacturer in, in Norway, uh, manufacturing uh, cars which are specialized for post delivery, actually. So we use these cars a lot, and it has now also become an export article to other posts. So, so we have now, I mean, electrical, um, smaller cars, I mean, ordinary cars for delivery uh, all over the country to the extent at all possible. There are some challenges still because Norway is a quite long country, so the longer routes are quite long and it's long and cold winters. So there are some uh, some issues with the charging still for the smaller cars, but all in all, we are getting there. We are getting to only electrical smaller cars. Then the hot topic right now is vans. We are transforming into having only uh, emission-free vans for all the delivery in, in urban areas. Uh, uh, we, we will stop buying anything but electrical vans from this year on. And all our vans for both urban and non-urban delivery should be emission-free from two, uh, 2026 on. So that is the big issue now is actually vans. They need to be emission-free very fast. Uh, and then there are large challenges, the trucks, the, the, the bigger trucks, because the, there are no satisfactory solutions and you have all this, I mean, you, you need the infrastructure to recharge and so forth. And, and the development isn't there yet. So, so uh, I think uh, regulation is very welcome, actually, and all efforts to increase demand for 
uh, vans and trucks that are electrical and stimulating uh, countries to to have the infrastructure for charging and for for non-fossil fuels in place so that you can actually operate those vans as for charging we have made our own charging networks actually on our terminals and so forth because even though the charging capacity in norway is relatively good it's not good enough so we have worked on that as well so so this is very much about pushing the technological uh, evolution actually technology and availability of of uh, smaller bigger and very big cars and trucks so 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 that they come become financially uh, competitive almost at least and start using them and you've hit upon a, a very interesting point there about the vast distances that are sometimes involved when you're outside of metropolitan areas and how you can decarbonize transport in, in those areas at NISP and if you want to look online there are a few articles online about what Poston's been doing with uh heavy vehicles and trucks and trials and doing in con collaboration with the local university as well if I recall correctly yes 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 um so thank you Christine for for that insight a quick comment from the comments, a comment from the comments, you all know what I mean, um, from Uzwin Ram, who says in post Fiji, the overall representation of women is 39, 39% at, and then at board level, 33%. So there you go. That's interesting from post Fiji. Thank you for that. And if anybody else wants to comment on uh, representation in your own organization, please do just chuck it in the comments um, and we'll uh, try and work it into our conversation. Now we've got a poll which we're about to launch. Um, so um, Katja from the UPU is going to hit a button in the background and launch the poll. Here it is, gender equality. So at the moment, in terms of gender equality, the postal sector is, oh, it has it in French as well for those of you who are French speakers. Um, so please choose your option. Is it unequal and not progressing fast? Is it still rather unequal but advancing well? rather equal, but some progress is still to be made, or is it presenting fully equal opportunities for women and men? Please vote, uh, cast your vote, and then um, after in a few minutes, we'll share the results with everyone. Um, Susan, if I might come back to you now, um, just this discussion about representation at the board level, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting discussion because it's often unseen, because it's outside of the control of the postal hierarchy. Um, do you have any comments on this? What do you mean outside of the control? Well, what I mean is that the CEO of a post doesn't appoint the board. <laughs> it's the other oh. way around. And who, who okay. appoints the board? So whilst a post might say, well, we're going to sign up and say we're going to have targets of whatever percent of representation of women in various levels of management, uh, it, it, how can the should the message go through to the regulators or um, the what are they call it you know, the ministerial shareholders, whoever it might be, who makes the decisions about um, board sure. representation? Okay, it will depend on the country, of course. Um, the regulator may or may not have a role. Um, the regulator may may have a more limited role. Uh, it could very well be the ministry that is supervising the post. But um, yeah, to to um, have some sort of, of of message sent to the the ministry in charge would would really help a lot i guess depending on the country there are also some countries that will that have set targets either binding or non-binding for female representation on boards as well which will then flow through to the postal organizations we might leave that topic where it is because i know it's a topic that we can only have limited input on and it can sometimes be political and we're not going to try and be political today on that. well not in not in this particular matter um Katja perhaps we can close the poll I'm, I'm sure everybody's had an opportunity to vote and then Katja if you could share the results of the poll on the screen so that we can see it all in a moment it'll pop up magically there we go so the results of the poll at the moment in terms of gender equality the postal sector is and the winner is at 57 percent still rather unequal but advancing well followed by rather equal, but some progress is still be made and in equal last place or equal third place, let's call it third place, unequal and not progressing past, fast along with presenting fully equal opportunities for women and men. That really does come down to that one of our questions today, what should be done to advance women's leadership in the post? Um, 
do any, any of our panelists have any further comments now that you've heard everybody's answer on it? Do you have anything else you'd like to share on, on this um, on this concept of how you, we can advance women's leadership in, in the post? And is it indeed, I ask a very naive question here, so please don't leap down my throat. Is, is it something that is up to men to advance or is it a message that has to be spread across equally? So just does anybody want to jump in without jumping down the throat? <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, really? sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Susan. <laughs> I'll jump in and, and rescue you here. Um, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with gender mainstreaming. Um, something struck me very recently um, when the uh, uh, the International Labor Organization and the uh, World Trade Association were hosting a joint seminar on gender trade and jobs. Angela Ellert, who is the Deputy Director General of the WTO, explained that in the last six years, the WTO has progressed from being a gender blind organization to being gender aware. She went on to say that the WTO is on a path to become a gender responsive organization. And the World Health Organization has a gender mainstreaming manual where it actually takes a five level approach from gender unequal all the way up to the scale of gender transformative, which is very similar to the poll that, that you just uh, asked everyone to respond to. But I think that um, this is something that everyone needs to be more aware of. It's not just enough to seek for quotas. We really need to examine every aspect of the employment field and uh, in the postal sector and try and improve it so that it is it is far reaching for everyone. And um, I'd uh, like to follow up on that, Susan and Ian, if I may. Um, it's a great question, Ian. Nobody's going to jump down your throat. I think uh, women, with respect to in, ensuring that the population of women in management continues to increase, women need to take some ownership of that, like we. We take really healthy ownership of a lot of things. And um, what we do at the Postal Service and what I do in my personal and professional life is I believe fully in a mentor program and a mentoring relationship. I know um, many of the characteristics that have led to my success are due to me having um, a woman in leadership as my mentor and just having those those conversations kind of stripping away all the noise and it, it could be a business discussion. It could be about perhaps, you know, non-business related concerns and how you're dealing with them. And once you, you have that rapport and you replicate those behaviors and you kind of, what you're getting is you're, somebody's reaching out a hand and they're, they're reaching out to you to pull you up into those ranks. And I, I feel that while, while I've personally benefited from that, I see it a lot in the Postal Service. I see a lot of camaraderie among the women in leadership reaching out to those others because we know they have a lot to offer and sometimes they can't do it alone. So we need to take ownership of that. Well, let me then raise another another issue and that's the gender pay gap. Um, I know some, some postal operators report on the gender pay gap. Um, would anybody like to comment on this on how on how posts or your own organization is making sure that men and women who do the same work are number one remunerated the same way and perhaps even given the same opportunities just sort of tap into what uh, Jennifer and Susan have just been saying can can that be achieved so not the gender pay gap is not only about ensuring that there is no pay gap that the pay is the same but there's also the opportunities that flow on from that would anybody like to comment on that Or if I ask a difficult question again. <laughs> I can just say, if I may, just that I checked the facts on that before before this session because I didn't know before. And it, it seems that women are on average a little bit better paid in all groups in, in, than men in, in Norway Post. I suppose that is because of differences in positions because I believe that there are quite strict that the same position is paid the same way. 
but I, I wasn't aware of it. I just had to check the facts <laughs> before this. But of course, I mean, unequal pay is, is, is a general issue, even in Norway still. It was, of course, a big issue before, much less of an issue now, but it is a very relevant issue still. We've heard a comment from Sophie who says, as the Laposte Board of Directors is made, it has 24 members, 13 men and 11 women. So that's an interesting comment there from La Poste in France. Uh, thank you, Sophie, for, for sharing that. Um, and we've got a few, I'm going to read a few more comments while, while I ask the next question, because all of a sudden it's, oh, look, in Ghana Post, thank you, Mary, uh, Ghana Post, representation of women management is 35%, but at board level, 14%. So thank you, Mary, for, for sharing that. Um, Pierre Angela, if I could ask a question of you, because obviously you've got a different perspective on all of this coming from the private sector. Um, when it comes to um, partnering or having, you know, partnering with other, other um, with suppliers or service providers, does sustainability and inclusivity play a part in selecting those um, providers or service partners? Well, uh, not in all the cases, not in all the cases, however, I think it's a very good uh, policy that we could implement, not only in the private, uh, private sector, but also in the public sector, because that will help us to really understand uh, if they are sharing the same values and the same uh, uh, direction that we want to, to lead uh, behind all the, 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 the gender equality. So that would be a very good idea to, to do that. Would any of our other panelists like to comment on that? I know that um, Christine, you mentioned about the war for talent, how you have to be, oh gosh, what did you call it? A license to operate? Mm -hmm. is, is, it, is, is that part of it? You're not just having a license to operate, but also it makes Poston an attractive service provider to prospective customers? Yes, I mean, I, I suppose I use the term license to operate on the um, uh, on the carbon emission uh, reduction path, because uh, without that, we will lose all our customers uh, and our attractiveness as as an employer. So, so we, yes. Right, and we've had a couple of comments that come in in French, so maybe if somebody could help me there, because uh, my French is limited to saying je ne parle pas de français, okay? So if somebody can help me out there with, um, just send me a message, someone from the UPU, just help me what the comments are that are in French there. Um, the, uh, the, the, another, uh, the comments come through um, from Carol, and I'm sorry if I haven't quite pronounced that correctly, talking about the inequalities in the economy and how it's embedded in society um, and uh, giving everything from girls having access to schooling through to opportunities, whether it's a university or whatever it is. Um, what role, I mean, we sort of explored this at the very beginning, you know, is there a broader role in society for the postal sector when it comes to encouraging participation, encouraging inclusivity. Would anybody like to comment on that? Talking about education, right? Yeah. Well, let's start with education, yes. Well, yes, I think we have, uh, we have to minimize all the different barriers that women have around the world. And one of them is education because um, in, in, in Latin America, for example, you have uh, limited access to education. And when you have to, to choose in your family, in your poor family, you, you always choose for the, for the men. And uh, the, the, the last option maybe is going to be a woman. And then um, they begin to, to, to form their family and they cannot uh, have any access to education. So educate women will help us to really drive a new uh, economy, a new society, a new community that help us to really incorporate them in, the, in a professional, in a professional uh, career, in a professional world. Um, so it, education is key, is key to, to really uh, drive this gender equality. And if we take a, a, a broader view then of the role of the postal sector, it's been suggested over the years that the post can be a driver of change. So we often talk about this in sustainability, 
as well as the idea of inclusivity. So the post being a driver of change, um, which I always think is interesting when there's a, there can sometimes be a public perception of the post as this antiquated legacy body. So um, Susan, I might just start with you from, from where you see, are you seeing that there's this possibility for posts to transform themselves, to go from this being perceived as um, this antiquated, you know, um, out of date monolithic organization to being a, a leader when it comes to inclusion, sustainability. Uh, well, well, let's just stick to those two for now. Sure. I, I um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the post has such a global network and has such a public face and has such in, in, in many countries, an element of trust. People trust the post. They may think it's old and, and decrepit as you say, but that's not true. And also they, if you try to shut the posts down, listen to the noise when people say, no, 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 we don't want our post office closed. People really trust the post. They trust the people who deliver the post. And when these uh, when these organizations are branching out, whether with civil society or with other international agencies other than the UPU or with their own governments, with their own um, postal ministry, as well as other ministries, such as ministries of health, um, Ministry of Finance and giving other services, it, it, it needs to be carefully thought out because it needs to be services that are in line with the with the government's sustainability goals. But absolutely, the post can, post can help in so many ways in delivering different services that many of which I've mentioned, um, and there's so many more. We have uh, recently published the. UPU Guide to Postal Social Services, and we have a wealth of information in that publication, just showing what the post already does. And we want to get the word out to member countries to let them know that there are lots of different ways the post can help. Jennifer or Christine, do you want to comment on this? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll chime in. I, 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 I'm appreciating this conversation and what, what I want to, to add on to my previous conversation about women in leadership and, and, and mentoring, I think, especially with respect to climate change and the increasing demand for resiliency, we all must be advocating for women's access to technology and the skills building, certainly that we mentioned earlier, but the technology and then the training on that technology is so important that they have workable, achievable options when those climate change challenges do occur. So that could be something as basic as really a, as understanding what and getting access to internet so that you have the handheld technology or whatever technology it is to show you what your options are when you are negatively impacted by climate change, whether that is um, the fact that, you know, the, the source of food in some of these countries is diminishing because what's happening to the waterways and the lack of rain and what's happening to, to other food sources, what are their options? And getting that information from technology is going to increase their resiliency. And that's, that's on all of us to, ensure that we're increasing just the access to technology, the skills building that is required to ensure that they have achievable options um, as climate change impacts become unbearable and, and certainly not sustainable. Any other comments would, on this? I'm oh, sorry, Christian, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I would be happy to comment as well. Um, uh, but from the sustainability perspective, I mean, posts are transport businesses, uh, basically transport and logistics and transport is uh, is a big part of the problem. Uh, so, so I mean, we, we can do a huge difference actually in, in working progressively on this. We are a big part of the problem and then potentially a big part of the solution. So we can actually form that demand, for instance, for better vehicles, uh, better technology, so forth. We can transform our businesses. Uh, we can push the development of solutions and so forth in, in the transport business. That, that's a big deal. It's, it's a big part of the, of the um, global climate problem. And, and uh, so we are really well positioned, actually better than many others to do something about it. 
So, so definitely we can show leadership in this and we can actually bring forward technologies and we, we can really make a difference in, in climate change. Well, Post certainly can move the needle a lot more than mm -hmm. some of the smaller operators out there. So I think it's, you, you're quite right. It absolutely is incumbent upon the posts to show leadership in these areas. Um, going to the Q&A, remember everybody, you can throw your questions in the Q&A and I will do my best to put them to the panelists as we go along. Now, I think from Margarita, it's more a comment than a question, but she says, often the lack of investment in care services and care policies, including maternity and paternity leave, I think we just call it parental leave these days in some countries, don't we, can contribute to increasing the gender pay gap. Thank you, Margarita, for for, for that comment. Um, now, Antonio's asked an interesting question. Um, are women allowed to um, do male delivery considering the heavy load of carrying the mail or are there some limitations? Um, I'm not aware of there being limitations on female involvement in male delivery anywhere, um, not even in you know, heavy freight and things like that. Um, does anybody want to make some comments on that? Um, I mean, I was, uh, any, anybody want to make a quick comment on, on that side of things? Don't rush me. I, I will. I will just say for the postal service, there are no limitations that, that at least that I am aware of, and um, I have, like I said earlier, I, I know a lot of women that work in my office and in and, and with us that started off as letter carriers, and they have this, you know, this ground up understanding of the importance of it. So I'm I'm unaware of any limitations with respect to that question. The same for me, Ian. Yeah. We don't have any limitation uh, in terms of shopping and carrying a lot of, of, of shopping carts to the to the houses. No limitation at all. I know that in Australian legislation, this definition of a safe lifting weight is decidedly opaque because it all depends on the person. What one person can lift safely, another person cannot. And that is purely down to your own physiology, your own capacity. Isn't it? But uh, thank you, Antonio, for the question. So I, th I think the, the short answer there is anybody more or less can be a postie. So please do continue to pop your questions in the Q&A and I'll put it to the panel as we go along. A couple now, someone's been good enough to translate the comments that have been left in French. So, ah, merci. There you go. That's my other French word, everybody. Um, now, in Benin, the Regulatory Council of the Electronic Communications and Post-Regulatory Authority is composed of 60% women. Um, in the Ivory Coast, there are no women on the board of directors, um, but the Ivory Coast, oh, that's a, there's a seven member board and no women on the board of postal regulation. However, 45% of women in the general management of the post office. Um, and oh, Kate, you've sent me a long comment here, Kate. I'll read it later and then put it to the, <laughs> to the panel. If we can continue this idea of the intersection of um, inclusivity and sustainability, um, we've talked about the, the leadership role of the post. Um, if we look at then, the, the post doesn't operate in a vacuum though. The post has its own customers. And it, so if you think of a post as the pipeline, there might be the e-commerce retailers, there might be the major mailers, et cetera, who then who generate mail items that we then deliver and they get delivered to consumers. Um, Susan, I might start with you. Do you think that the posts do a good enough job of communicating what they're trying to achieve in whether sustainability goals, um, inclusivity and things like that? That's a bit of a difficult question to answer. Um, I don't see, we at the EPU don't, don't see what they're doing so much at national level. Um, I imagine they're doing a lot. Um, but at the international level, we would like to help them increase that profile um, in our cycle for the next four years after the, the Congress that we had last year, we have mandates to work on environment action and on gender action. So we are looking to help the posts in terms of national international campaigns um, and and other services that that we can provide to them any other comments on my terrible question before we move on to something more sensible 
No. Um, now, um, Kate Muse just made a comment here in the comments. Um, I would recommend that you all have a look at it, talking about um, Title IX of the Education Amendment um, in 1972 in the USA. So those of you who are interested in that, please just um, check Kate's comment there. Um, and uh, we've had a comment from Mary uh, saying, in Nigeria Post, more than 65% of women in middle management are women, uh, while women at representation at top management is 35%. So some interesting comments there. Um, I'd, I'd like to now put a question to each of you, which is a bit of a, a classic question, but I think it's super relevant considering the, the makeup of our panel today and that your different backgrounds and certainly the different roles that you do at each of your organisations. If you were to give advice to your younger self, whether you're just starting out in work or maybe even at a difficult point in your career, what would be the kind of advice that you would give to your younger self? As I said, whether you're either when you're starting out or whether you've hit a, a difficult point in your career. Christine, I might go to you first. You've got a wistful smile on your face. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, yes, what would that be? I, I, I think a good advice to both uh, me, the younger me and, and me generally, and to everyone else actually is to be courageous, to have courage, to, to dare to do, I mean, what you deep down really want to do. That is uh, that would be my advice, I think, and it's it's a kind of advice that may seem simple, but maybe I mean sometimes it's a tough uh, world out there, so sometimes it's it's difficult. But uh, have courage. Dare to you give us an example of what courage might mean for you or for 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 someone starting out their career. What would you mean by courage? Yeah, sometimes it's oh, it's different things, but it's it's it may be to to kind of stand up for your values and beliefs. Sometimes, I mean, you may meet a group of people who have are going in a direction that are contrary to your more fundamental values and beliefs, and and stand up for them. I think. Uh, you feel better that way and 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 maybe you gain courage if if you kind of dare to stick to what you really believe and sometimes and i personally have have sometimes met uh, a tough resistance but i think that is um, i think that is the good way forward actually to to try and try and be courageous some, sometimes it's it's, Jennifer, it's you're, my you're advice not, you're next on the screen as i'm looking at so Jennifer, would you what what's what's your response so I, I will build on what Christine said. Uh, don't be afraid. Change is good. Uh, and many of my employees, my family members have heard me say change is good. Embrace the change. And I say don't be afraid to Christine's be courageous is because I can I'm thinking of one point in my career where I was just, you know, having issues with the management and despite my efforts, I didn't see anything changing. So I left that organization and that was kind of scary, right? But in looking back, it was probably a pivotal point in my career because leaving that organization and then come and actually coming back to it made increased my level of awareness and of opportunities. And um, to use Christine's word, made me more courageous. So don't be afraid, change is good embrace the change and, and and drive change i think and when people see you driving change you know that's a natural leadership quality and people will encourage your continued leadership and pierre angela i might come to you next because you've had an interesting career you've you've worked at colgate palm olive and coca-cola and major companies like this what would your advice be to your younger self starting out or if you've there was that moment of of crisis in your career what would your advice be Yes, I think uh, it's almost maybe the same, but uh, in other words, uh, that uh, if you have an idea, if you have a dream, you have to believe in that. Don't think too much about that. Just do it. Uh, follow up, even follow up your ideas, even they are not perfect. It's better to do that and and to drive your 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 what what you want to do, what you want to get um, very early, and work for that. And the only limits, it's those limits that you impose yourself, but uh, there, there's no limit. It's it's maybe in your mind and you have to have not only courage, uh, but also a lot of determination to, to make it happen. Susan, you know what I'm going to ask you, so. <laughs> <laughs> they took mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I, I think um, I have a, a different take perhaps on this. Um, I think that Jennifer and, and Kristen both were talking about the fact that we need, we, we can't have a good organization with only 50% of, of, of the people involved. We can't have a good organization with just men. It, we need to have women too. I think that in the movement for gender equality and empowerment of women, we need men to step up too. We need not just women, but also the men to say, this is the right thing and it needs to be done. Because again, we're not gonna change the world with just 50% of it in, in favor of what's going to happen next. Earlier, um, I think it might've been you, Jennifer, you mentioned um, mentoring. And so this question that we've just asked and answered, does that is that a key part of mentoring? So when you're mentoring, um, being mentored or mentoring uh, someone, are these the kind of questions that come up? Jennifer, perhaps if you could just comment on that. I think the success, uh, you have a successful mentoring relationship if you can ask any question and ask for any guidance. So it's a, it's a healthy discussion. And if you can discuss your fears and your concerns openly, and be able to generate that dialogue, which should be about options and maybe um, helping with a leg up, that, that is the beauty of, of a strong mentoring relationship. And if I might ask a naive question, what should someone look for when they're choosing a mentor? Mm, that's a good question. I, I think, um, I, I think you need to be open minded. I think there might be people might be drawn to people like themselves, but they they shouldn't limit it to that. Right. I think this um, you should look in with a very diverse eye and a very diverse viewport to get that perspective that maybe is not in your regular dialogue. So I, I don't know that there's a clean answer to that, Ian. Well, it's, it's all, the answer is almost, you know, seeking diversity in your own mentoring can also help expand your own comprehension. And your or, viewport. Yes, exactly. Mm. Would anybody else like to comment on the concept of mentoring before we move on? No. All right. Um, well, quick, hey, Susan. I was going to say, I believe I've had several mentors uh, throughout my career and they also have helped me quite a lot. Um, being a woman over so many years, they have been men as well. They have helped me very much. It, it, it's not important whether it's man or woman, but it's, it's got to be someone that you can have an honest relationship with and that, that, um, you, you feel comfortable talking to them and you, you feel that, um, that it's, it's, it's a safe place, but, but there are plenty of people out there, I think, who are willing to, to be a mentor for a younger person who's just starting out. Thank you for those answers, please. Uh, we've got another 20 minutes on the clock. So if you have any other questions, those of you who are watching along, I was going to say at home, you might be at home, you might be at the office, uh, please do pop them in the Q and A and I'll do my best to, to um, ask them of our panel. Um, a quick comment from Octavia, um, who says in St. Kitts in the Caribbean, um, we have 100% women in middle management. So there you go. Um, I don't think, well, I was going to say, I don't think anyone can beat that. I know <laughs> no one can beat that. It's uh, quite impressive. Um, another question, uh, is single parenting uh, something that can affect productivity? Now, that I guess perhaps we should ask a, a broader question, which is as a, a management structure, how can you make sure that you include people no matter what their home situation is, whether it's a single mother, single father, or whoever it is, whatever their, their, their home life is, how can you create a family friendly environment? Perhaps I want to, that's a very broad question. Perhaps I should ask something more specific. Can each of you think of something that you've seen that you think helps create a family friendly environment, either in your current organization or in an organization you've worked for previously? Would anybody like to 
share a sort of uh, something you've seen at work that that helps create a family friendly environment in the workplace i i will say that um being able to that employees feel comfortable having that open conversation um, because managers don't typically ask you know what's going on in your personal life it's pretty well, might not even be able to yeah right so if the employee is is comfortable enough to share challenges that they're having um and to to get any assistance or any understanding or maybe um a more favorable interpretation of, of of allowable leave or an understanding that maybe they need to telework for whatever reason it could be for a child or for a parent or you know especially as as the population gets older so having that you know creating that atmosphere of being able to have that open dialogue is critically important and um and then being responsive to to the concerns of the employee as as much as possible any other comments from our panel i can i can add something um, i mean in norway we are very lucky to have a very parent friendly legal uh, framework that ensures that it is possible to to be a mother and a father and uh, and, and still having a career and that I think I am extremely supportive of that. So I think what, what helped us a lot, uh, which was introduced in the 1990s and which has been developed is that the parent leave needs to be shared between the mother and the father. Uh, and fathers take now almost as long parent leaves as mothers do. And for fathers, it is more or less considered, you know, as a right to be together with their children. So they kind of claim, fathers claim their rights as, as, as a father and being able to, to kind of combine career and, and parenthood. And for me, that has been extremely important because when we employ, I mean, we, we actually want to employ people who are younger than 50 and who can, <laughs> can become a parent for the first time or the second or the third or whatever and 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 so we don't know i mean if we are hiring a woman or a man whether that person is likely to have a parent leave or not so it doesn't make any difference for us so if we hire a woman who is i don't know 30 years old or a man who is 30 years old you know that that person can always become a father but it isn't an issue we have a lot of we we have a lot of uh, framework in place to handle that it isn't an issue actually so so but we are very lucky i know that we are in norway we are very lucky to have it that way in that in many other countries it's it's um, it's not the same way but my my input <laughs> my advice to others who make policies in that respect would be actually to ensure that you you kind of divide the the parent leave and the possibility to be you know 100 percent parent uh, equally as as equally as possible as possible between the mother and the father so that uh, there is no discrimination actually when when uh, people are recruited thank you but i know uh, that is uh, i know that, uh, that it's special because we have this kind of legal framework so it's not that easy i understand that it can sound easy but it isn't but it is important it does make a huge difference i'm sure that at one point it sounded very difficult before it sounded easy it probably sounded difficult if that makes sense um we've had a couple more comments and questions come in uh jennifer johnson at bahamas post says bahamas post has gone from being about 90 percent men 10 years ago is about 90 percent female now postmaster general's female permanent secretary's female the minister is female and managers are about 95 percent female so interesting there jennifer i, I I think we'd all be interested to hear what what drove that change, what 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 created such a cultural change within Bahamas Post. So um, feel free to share a comment with everybody there. That sounds very interesting. Um, uh, another comment that's come through from Octavia again at in St Kitts and Nevis. Mentoring is essential in a new organisation. I am where I am in the Post because of positive mentorship. So that's sort of well, there's a personal another personal testimonial about the value of of mentoring within within organizations um, please everybody please keep putting your questions in the q a or share your comments in the chat um, and in the last few minutes that we have well, again i'll 
do my best to get the questions through to the panel. Um, the the just if we might return to get to the environmental aspect of things, um, moving away from the the inclusivity part, or talk talk a bit about sustainability. Um, and uh, Susan, you mentioned at the outset, I can't remember what it was that you said, and we said, well, there's also the the, the UPU in, interacts with other other UN bodies, and we've obviously we've seen over the last few years many comments about the sustainable development goals. What what are you seeing at the UPU? How are the UPU is interacting with other UN bodies to help achieve these goals? Is there anything that you can share with all of us um, of what's what's happening um, at the UPU level? Of course, in several areas, uh, all UN bodies have a reporting requirement. Every year, we need to report our carbon footprint. There's there's quite a a detailed program, and and that's published every year in something called Greening the Blue. And uh, United Nations Environmental Program publishes all UN agencies that report in on their, their progress. Uh, UN SWAP um, is the United Nations um, Gender Equality and, and Empowerment of Women Program, where we also need to report in every year and give our, our uh, progress in that regard. Um, there are frequent, frequent meetings, both formal and informal, uh, heads of agency, as well as representatives and experts from, from all areas where we exchange ideas um, about uh, how to move forward. Talking of mentoring, the UN Women is a very good resource for, for any agency that wants to set a, a, a gender policy, and we have contacted them as well, and we will be contacting them much more to, to have advice on our policy. There are guidelines for uh, sustainability management systems, which is something that we will also be working on. And someone, uh, UPU Communication has just put in the, uh, the comments, www.greeningtheblue.org. Um, and the, the UN is a tremendous resource for the other agencies that, that want to, to move forward. And, and of course, we all um, have that, that um, uh, we have that mandate to to move forward on all of the sustainable development goals. Now we've had a great question from Colleen in the Q and I. Um, do you think that men are more open now to accept women in leadership? Now, you're all in leadership positions, so do you think that men are more open now to accept women in leadership? Uh, who gets to start with this one? Um, I guess, Christine, you're, you're right next to me on the screen. So I'm going to start with you. What, do you have any observations there? Do you, th do you think that men are more open now to accepting women in leadership or is it not even a relevant question anymore? Yeah, it's, uh, well, my impression is that on this aspect, there are big cultural differences in the world still. Um, in our own, own culture, I think so very much. Uh, we have, well, I don't know, 30 years of experience more with women prime ministers and in political life and top uh, public positions with uh, as many women as, as men. So, so we are kind of become gender blind, I think, in, in those positions. But in business still, uh, there is an underrepresentation of women in the top positions. But I do not think that is due to men not accepting women leadership. I think that is fully accepted actually now. So, but there are probably some various me mechanisms in place still in, in a country like Norway, which has worked seri seriously on this for a, uh, for a time. We, we haven't achieved it in, in business, but um, so so I would say for, 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 I mean, where I come from, I do not think it is an issue that men do not accept women leaders uh, at the same level as, as they accept uh, men as leaders but it's jennifer to be a, an issue other uh, jennifer of course the previous postmaster general was a woman so um we know that there's a recent history of leadership at the very top of the usps so speaking generally what what, what do you have any comments or observations of, of of this on this matter i think it's it's a good question and i think the good news is that it, it's almost i'd like to think it's not a relevant question because of you know, women in leadership and, but given, given the great depth of our organization and the geographic expanse, 
it's impossible to say, or it's naive to say that people are um, gender neutral or gender blind in decision making, just as it's impossible to say that they're blind or neutral to hiring people of different colors and different diversity or different disabilities. So it's an evolution and it's definitely moving in the right direction. And as you mentioned, certainly our postmaster general, our last postmaster general was a woman. And so we, we really kind of set the tone there, but it's more than just gender. It's, it's diversity, it's disabilities. And um, the question should be, really be, what is their ability for leadership? And if we can take away the gender and the colors and um, the, uh, you know, the, the noise outside of the actual abilities, then we'll be stronger together. Pierre-Angela, do you want to add anything to what um, Christine and Jennifer have, have said, uh, given your perspective from the private, private pers oh, I'll get in a second, from the private sector? I think, I think um, men are accepting, accepting a uh, woman leadership. However, we need to, to work much more in terms of um, specific tools, specific uh, policies that could help us to really have a, a space in the in a professional world. Um, because sometimes uh, we need to really understand, if, as, as Jennifer said before, if we really are prepared to lead some some sectors, some aspects, and, and for sure we are really capable to do that. But we need to to work to be prepared to 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 really do a, a good work. And those are those kind of um, tools like mentoring, coaching, uh, educating other areas, have a different experience. But men, men, I think they are accepting. We have to to really uh, drive and lead that space to make this happen. And Susan, do you have any quick comments on this? It's a matter of unconscious bias that is the barrier to inclusion. And that's something that, that needs to be addressed through gender mainstreaming and, and inclusivity. And it's it's not something that we can help. It's it's natural. It's something that, that everyone falls back on, but we've got to be aware and we've got to change attitudes so that we can become more inclusive as a society. May I comment on that? Because I agree that there is an unconscious bias. So, so there have been experience with ap applications where they remove name and there are no photos and that give, uh, you know, different results. So that kind of techniques can actually help us uh, go beyond that or kind of, uh, yeah, uh, deal with those kind of biases that uh, definitely exist. But there are techniques that are quite good and give surprising results. Thank you for those answers uh, and please um, if you're watching along please do pop your questions in the Q&A. Um, I know it's been a, a very diverting discussion and we've gone down very gone off on lots of tangents but I, I can't help it I find these things interesting. Um, a question from Shibu who says what are your expectations from the male colleagues from your from the male colleagues in your respective organizations? I feel like that almost ties in with the previous question. Um, so expectations from male colleagues. Um, does anybody want to comment on on this? You know, how, how well, I'll ask the question. Does anybody have any, any quick comments on this? For me, it's respect, respect. Uh, really, really look at us like we are equal person, human being. For me, it's respect. I, I'm going to agree with Piangela. I think uh, respect is key. Uh, respect is key from male colleagues towards their male and female colleagues. Respect is also key from, from women managers to, to understand and appreciate um, the many differences. And, and I think respect comes with being open-minded. Almost more broadly though, they, they are the key characteristics of a good manager respect, understanding others, would you say? Yes. So it's almost raising the bar for anybody who's already in management or wants to be in a managing position. You need to be able to have a broader understanding of your, of your direct reports, of your colleagues, um, or even those above you anyway. Um, 
we are almost out of time and it has been a, a really wide ranging conversation, everything from electric vehicles through to the you know, mentoring program. <laughs> it's such a wide ranging conversation. Um, so please, uh, with the two minutes we have left, perhaps I might just go around quickly and ask each of you if you have any final comments that you'd like to share with with our audience today whether it's on the topic of sustainability the topic of inclusion uh, what you think's next um or what whatever you would like to comment on is related to these topics please uh well i tell you at this time we're going to go in the reverse order instead of starting with christine we're going to start with susan so susan your opportunity to be first off the line here please i'd just like to quickly highlight some of the things that the upu is doing in this uh, next four years we have a resolution on climate action, which mandates the setting of targets for greenhouse gas reduction, as well as standards for a carbon neutral postal product. And this is going to be carried out strictly by extra budgetary funds from donors. Right, near, right now we are at about 40% of the amount that we need to be able to carry this forward. And then we have a group this year or, or this cycle in the Postal Operations Council, which is called the Sustainable Postal Services Group. And we would love it if the post would be willing to join this group either as a member or as an observer. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, Pierre Angela, uh, any final comments from you before we wrap up? Yes, I want to only share that uh, we really think uh, we really need to think about women equality because when women use their power, they're reinvest families, communities, countries, and we really need this kind of change in the economy, in the world. Thank you, Pierre Angela and Jennifer at the USPS. Any final comments from you? I would just add and underscore that gender equality, um, climate change, environmental justice are all necessarily intertwined and we can't achieve success in in our work life in in our climate vision if we don't see the need for you know giving that helping hand providing the leadership and uh, providing the skills and abilities necessary for, for as as we spoke earlier necessary for the women and the, and the other diverse groups to to have a voice and to ensure that their voice is heard and Christine, finally, some thoughts from you. Oh, please. there has been said so many wise words now, so I, I agree with it all. Uh, so I, I would just like to say thank you for kind of lifting up these two so extremely important subjects and, and, and binding them together a little bit so that we can see the connection because there is a connection and they are fundamental. So, so thanks for that. Well, uh, thank you everybody for taking part today. Uh, thank you to Katja and the tech team at the UPU. Thank you to the interpreters who have been trying to decipher my Australian accent. Good luck and thank you. Um, and uh, as always, thank you to um, our panelists. Uh, so thank you to Christine Baragum from Poston Norie. Thank you, Jennifer um, Rave from uh, the US Postal Service. US Postal Subservice left out of my mind there for a moment. Um, thank you very much to Pierangela Sierra as well from Tipti. And of course, thank you, Susan Alexander from the UPU for being part of it. Um, thank you all very much for your comments and your questions today from the audience. Um, go to the UPU website to sign up for the UPU email updates. So you get an email every time they're doing something like this, whether it's a webinar or something interesting. There's always lots of interesting content coming out of the UPU. And Susan has also mentioned some of the interesting research that the UPU has been doing as well. So just that I know that the team's I'm pointing over here because that's where the comments are on my screen. Um, there are a few links there in the comments. So thank you everyone again. And good night, good afternoon, good morning, and see you later. <laughs> thank you everybody. Oh, and happy International Women's Day.